Hello, my name is Jeannie White Melendez. I'm a registered vascular technologist, registered phlebology sonographer, and a fellow from the Society for Vascular Ultrasound. And I'm going to speak to you today about May Thurner syndrome. And what I'd like to do is tell you the real story. First up is an anatomical review. We're gonna start with the femoral vein. More precisely, we're starting with the orange depicted vessel there, which is the common femoral vein. As we ascend towards the heart, as we pass underneath the inguinal ligament, we will come to the external iliac vein. The external iliac vein is depicted here in green. The external iliac vein will confluence with the internal iliac vein. The internal iliac vein, as you can see, is the draining source of the pelvis. As the internal iliac and the external iliac confluence together, they become the common iliac vein, which is depicted there in blue. And obviously you have this on the left and the right side. The common iliac veins join together to become the inferior vena cava, which is depicted here in purple. The inferior vena cava is commonly begins at the level of the fifth lumbar vertebrae. It penetrates the diaphragm and terminates in the right atrium. When I was initially taught about May Thurner syndrome many years ago, I was taught that May Thurner syndrome was when the left common iliac vein passed under the right common iliac artery next to the spine, creating an extrinsic compression by the two of them between the spine and the artery, and the vein was just actually getting squished between them. And that squishing of them caused an obstruction. And sometimes because of that obstruction, the patient would develop a deep venous thrombosis or a venous insufficiency on the left leg. What I was initially taught wasn't incorrect. It's just that it doesn't tell the whole story and there's a lot more to it. So let's think about that obstruction. Well, what we know about veins is we don't like obstruction, not intrinsically or extrinsically. We know that over 150 years ago, the German pathologist, Dr. Rudolf Virchow, postulated that thrombus formation and propagation resulted from abnormalities in three key areas, stasis, vessel wall injury, and hypercoagulability. This triad or three-part setup led to thrombosis. In order for me to explain the whole story, I have to take you back in time. Let's imagine I take you back to the 1950s. If you can imagine this time, you may conjure up thoughts of drive-ins, photos of Marilyn Monroe while filming The Seven Year Itch on the streets of New York, and a time when burgers were only 15 cents. Wish I lived during that time. And in the 1950s, to be exact, let's talk about 1957. There was an article that appeared in a journal, the cause of predominantly sinistral occurrence of thrombosis of the pelvic veins. It was in angiology. The authors, May, and Thurner. When I first read the original paper, I had to actually look up one of the words in the title of the paper, sinistral. Sinistral is an adjective describing left side. So the cause of the predominantly sinistral or left side occurrence of thrombosis of the pelvic veins leads us to believe that May Thurner syndrome is a left-sided disease. Before we go any further, we actually have to go back in time even more. If you look at the original May Thurner paper, one of their reference is a paper that was written by McMurich, and it was a published paper in the British Medical Journal. This was written in 1906. McMurich was an anatomist from Michigan University, and in that original paper, he described a lateral spur or colossal, like wing-like 
tender membrane that protruded or partially obstructed the medial or lateral wall of the iliac vein. So I thought I'd bring the two years together, 1906 when McMurtz published, and the colossal or wing-like projections, which I thought looked a lot like Marilyn Monroe's famous dress from the 1950s.